My name is Rob Adams and I'm the General Manager of City Design at the City of Melbourne. And what I would like to talk to you about today is roads are places too. And why do we say this? Well, we say this because 80% of all the public space in the city is made up of roads. And so in looking at a proposition around congestion, there are two things that are important. There's a mixture of use and there's density. And the mixture of use is very much so you can actually walk to everything you need to get to. And the density provides an economic basis to make that part of the city successful. So in Melbourne, we started back in 1985 looking at both of those aspects in our central city because we had a downtown that was a dead downtown. Everybody had moved out to the suburban shopping centres. And we started to look at what buildings we could refurbish to get people to live back here. And the program is called Postcode 3000. We converted old buildings into residential. We saved a lot of the heritage fabric by changing those to residential. Previously, only the ground floors had been used for retail and the upper floors were deserted. We took on the back of the crash of the property market in the late 1990s, com commercial office buildings and repurposed those to go to residential. And you can see here an old office building and an addition to the top of that building. So in 1982, we had 685 residential dwellings in our downtown. And the program was successful and took off. And over that period, from the early 1980s to 2016, we got 41,000 dwellings come back downtown. Today, we're over 45,000 dwellings. And this has completely changed the nature of our downtown. We have cafes, restaurants, supermarkets. People call this place home and live here. The impact on that was to make us look at how we could adapt that environment. How do we take things like the road space and turn them into public space for people? And the program we're calling here is Grey to Green. And what we've done is over a period of 30 years, we've taken 80 hectares of asphalt out of our central city and converted it to public open space. We, we've taken roads and we've reprioritized the space. We've taken space away from the motor cars and given it to people for cafes, restaurants, and planting trees. So we've gone through the city and slowly repurposed the space in many areas. We've taken parking off one side of the small streets in our central city and extended the footpaths, leaving parking only on, the one, uh, on, on a single side. And this has helped the retail because people have more space to walk and time to stop and window shop. We took, in 1992, the main street through our central city and closed it to all through traffic and reprioritized it for trams, uh, pedestrians and bicycle. So the street that was dying, as you can see on the left-hand slide here, suddenly became more vibrant. We planted 100 trees, we put in public art, and over a period since 1993 to 2017, we saw the daily traffic between 10 in the morning and 6 in the evening increase from 12,000 people to over 47,000 people. This was now a street for people, a street that was vibrant and active, and that congestion was bringing economic activity back to the central city. The, the program led to more aggressive taking of space. So South Bank Boulevard that you can see here used to take 30,000 cars. We closed the end of it for the Commonwealth Games in 2006, and the number of cars dropped to uh, 13,000. On the basis, we took half of the space, as you can see in the colored here, and, and we're currently converting that to park space. So a road like this will look like a park like this at, at the moment. This road will look a bit like this. And we also looked at other spaces, redundant rail infrastructure that was right on the, the door front of the city. We started to look at that and take it back. In 1986, we had this idea that we could have a public space, a park that ran around the whole eastern side of the city. And you can see that in the black and white diagram. The aspiration was to join that up and by the year 2000, have a continuous park running around the edge of Melbourne. We got to close all but 12 of the railway lines, 
move the marshalling out to the, uh, the exterior of the city and design this new park, Birang Ma, which houses many of the events that we need for the new city. At the moment, we've got two, 10 new parks under construction in the central city. Roads like this illustration have been closed and repurposed as public open space. So that is the one aspect. The next question you wanted to know was uh, our experience at Queen Victoria Market and our view of public-private partnerships. Queen Victoria Market is one of our very, very important heritage assets and over many years we've been trying to find the money to repurpose it. What we've done here is we've taken previously allocated land like car parking, which is an A, and roads like in D, and we've closed those down and combined them and made them into development sites. We did this with the state government and we did it with their full approval. And what that meant is that we could take an area like this, which was our market, which you can see with the, the, the roofs and the solar panels on them, and turn car parks and roads into public space, as you can see on the bottom slide. This meant we could take a road that was worth $700,000 and turn it into a development site that was worth over $95 million. And we could reinvest that money back in the market, making the market a more viable place for the traders that use that. So our view of public-private partnerships, as illustrated by this, is where we take our assets, and in this case, it was one of the sites next to Queen Victoria Market, which we bought for 86 million, build community facilities, parking, childcare, affordable housing, etc. And then if you take back the benefits, including the benefits of being able to sell other uh, community facilities that were now redundant because of the new facilities, and the value of the urban space we created from the public car park, we made a $118 million profit on this transaction. So this gives some idea of how our city has been shifting. And one of the cultural shifts that the city now needs to make is in the larger metropolitan area. Back in 2010, I wrote a paper called Transforming Australian Cities. And what this looked at is a new way of looking at our cities. What we were doing and what was happening in all the capital cities of Australia is that all those people at the centre of the city, shown by green in these uh, maps here, had access to all the facilities they needed, while increasingly the people on the fringe of the city were isolated, having to travel to work long distances, and with the consequences of things like family violence and obesity and other things coming on board. Every time our, our government wanted to create new land, they went to the fringe rather than actually coming back on ourselves. They were taking good, good agricultural land and turning it into asphalt and houses. When you looked at the consequences, you could see that the fringe was not benefiting. And so the, the proposition is how do you turn that around? We could see the economic benefit from obesity alone and diabetes. You could save a staggering $58 million uh, annually. So there was a real reason to do it. The lesson came to me from the university I went to. I was born in Zimbabwe and, and went to university in Cape Town in South Africa. When I went there as a baby boomer in the mid 60s, the universities were all expanding. Our university had, in 1970, had 5,000 students. It was built on the side of Table Mountain and designed by Herbert Baker. And when I went back 40 years later, it had almost three times the number of students, but they hadn't added many buildings. Traveling overseas in 1969, when I was looking at all the universities extending, I went back and asked the planners at the university what are you going to do? All the other universities I've been to expanding, yet you stuck on Table Mountain within a national park, you can't expand. And they said, we've asked a different question. The question we've asked is how well are we using the facilities we already have? And when they asked that question, they found things like lecture theatres were only being used for 17 and a half percent of the time. So they used that strategy to treble their population without building much fabric at all. I took that lesson and took it back to Melbourne and said, how do we move from 5 million to 10 million by 2050? 
And what would that look like if we didn't build any extension to our city? And I've called it the 7.5% city. What it means is that you could go to places like the railway station, the activity centres, and if you take the land that you can see in the dotted line, you can add in 860,000 people by building on 60% of the land and no higher than eight storeys. And we have lots, lots of those centres as shown by the dots on this map here. So rather than being a, a, a monocentric city, we could become a polycentric city. And there's nothing new in that concept. We could also take the links between those centres, the road-based public co uh, transport corridors we, where we run trams and buses, and they made up another 3% of the land, and we could repurpose those. And we had this extensive system of both tram and bus routes that cover the city. So our trams and our trains run out in a radial system, and then the grid that covers that is our bus system. It's a perfect transport system, but badly managed and badly run. So by not changing much, we could start to look at the city and pick out the parcels along these corridors that could be uh, redeveloped. There were one, one and a half million parcels in the, in the city at the time. And we went through and measured the sensitivities. We selected land parcels that uh, didn't have the parks, didn't have public use or industry, all had rear lane access so we could create good street frontages. We didn't have big entrances to car parks off the main street. We took out recently developed sites and we took out heritage uh, listed buildings and also 50% of the sites where there was heritage overlay. What that left us with was that we had at the end of that, under the trams, we had 48,000 uh, sites, and under bus, we had 158. And if you develop that at reasonable densities of between 180 to 450, and uh, towns like uh, Vienna go to uh, about 900 per hectare, you could put in 2.4 million people along those corridors. Corridors that looked like this, corridors that had the expensive infrastructure, the tram down the middle, but the fabric along those corridors was now redundant and underutilised. It could become like this. In streets that have those tram corridors, that process has started. So here, this tiny building on the right-hand side has a density of 200 uh, people per hectare. Set back behind the shop frontage, when you go down the street, you hardly notice it. So you can increase the density without taking the character away from the street. This happened and we got development along our tram corridors. The developers, although the government had not seen the opportunity, the developers did see the opportunity. And we got developments along these corridors, both social housing and normal housing. The last one and a half percent came from our grey field sites, like our docklands, where we redeveloped that. And what that meant is we were taking our existing city and taking the fabric and the transport uh, infrastructure and we were adding fabric along that, those lines and around centres. And this enabled us to get to the place where we could preserve the areas in between, those areas that are valued by the inhabitants. So we didn't have to build over the whole city. We only had to build over 7.5%. That became politically an easy thing to sell and also allowed people to walk out of their areas to high-density mixed-use areas. The spaces in between could become the new green wedges. They could be where we collected our water, where we planted trees, where we had solar panels. And they could be the lungs of the city with these corridors running through them. The cost of doing that enabled us to look at every one million people that we added to the city by not expanding the city. We saved $110 billion in infrastructure. That very simple principle of getting greater utilization out of your existing assets. We've seen examples like that when they've had earthquakes in uh, New Zealand and Christchurch, where the schools one day were, were crushed to the ground with the earthquake, and those that remained three days later had students in, but students in the morning, students in the afternoon. So they didn't have to rebuild the schools, they just had to re timetable. So the greatest challenge for our city and many cities is not building the infrastructure, we haven't got the time or money, 
It's re-timetabling to get greater utilization out of what we've got. Much of what we do is incremental. And there are disadvantages to that because if you change a, a footpath by widening it slightly and planting a tree, people don't notice it. It's like warming up a bath. So we worked very closely with Young Gal and we measured the changes in our city. And we were able to show over time incredible increases in the amenity and of, of the central city. Increases in people living there, the number of places for people to sit. And only then did people start to realize that the slow change that was happening over 30 years was having a marked impact on the city. We took a city that was dying in 1985 and we turned it into a city that became the world's most livable city for seven years in a row. And that was done predominantly on incremental changes to the fabric we already had, not mass, mass demolition, but adaption and reutilization. Congestion, that is people congestion, not traffic congestion. So that's the story of Melbourne. And I hope in that short talk, you get some idea of the strategies we've used. Thank you, and it's been a pleasure talking to you.